Welcome to the Conscious Cafe. This podcast is designed to wake you up, blending old soul knowledge with new age intellect. I'm Izzy, your host, and I hope you enjoy this week's blend. It's time to wake up. Are you ready? Hello, my friends, and welcome back to the Conscious Cafe. This week's brew is a light roast blend of nature, love, connection, and spirituality, commissioned by Christian of Standing Stones Healing. It was a joy to talk with Christian today about his own spiritual journey and how we can all bring more awareness, meaning, and connection to our lives. Stay tuned to the end for our parting gift to you, and in the meantime, your weekly cup of consciousness is ready, so let's get started. Hello, my friends. I am joined here today by Christian Reifsteck of Standing Stones Healing. Christian, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Oh, Isabel, thank you so much. I'm so excited and honored to be here. Absolutely. Now, as this is our first one, I would love if you could introduce yourself and give us a little backstory and and how you got to where you are. Great. Thank you so much. Um, As with any and all of us, our spiritual journeys are long winding paths and um, mine is no different. So I was raised Catholic and, um, you know, much like um, Christine mentioned in last week's episode, um, which by the way, everyone, if you have not listened to last week's podcast with Christine, uh, I highly, highly recommend that. It was excellent. And And uh, I really enjoyed listening to it. So thank you to you and to Christine as well. But a lot of what she talked about with her Catholic experience really resonated with me. I was raised very Catholic um, and I really found uh, quite... um, you know, she talked about this idea of Catholic mysticism. And for me, that really resonated. That was very much my experience with Catholicism. I had a positive experience with it. And it was really um, a very mystical kind of experience. Um, And so I really was very devoted to the faith until, you know, when we hit our, um, our adolescent years, especially our college years, um, we are finding our own way we are growing and developing as our own human beings. We are expanding into the world. And so along with that, um, my growth and expansion in my spirituality um, really uh, grew in a very more nature-based kind of way. And so that's really the foundation of my spirituality and my spiritual path. And um, so I ended up... um, Uh, you know, in this uh, nature-based spirituality, um, uh, have been following that for quite a while. I I don't identify as any one particular thing. Um, And so I I no longer identify as Catholic. However, I still respect uh, the religion and I still, um, some some of it does resonate with me, Uh, but um, I don't identify as any one thing. Now, through my spiritual journey, um, I have become a Reiki master, and and, uh, I was attuned in 2014, 2014, yes. Um, And actually, the way that I became attuned is is really wonderful. You know, for those of us who um, uh, are uh, Reiki lovers, Reiki practitioners, Um, we know that Reiki itself is a journey and that we have a Reiki journey. And so my journey came through, um, I uh, was a staff member and an instructor at a community college. And this community college offered Reiki as one of the courses. And as a staff member, I could take free classes. And so I saw the class listed and I said, you know, I've heard about Reiki. I've seen signs for it. I've heard about it. I don't know what it is. I'm just going to take this class Um, because I definitely took quite a few classes through that community college. So uh, I received uh, all of my attunements during that class. 
I had two master teachers who are just absolutely wonderful women. And uh, the way that they structured the class was that the attunements were all set within the, the time frame, um, and they all fit within that class. So I received all of my attunements during that class right within the time frame um, in which, uh, you know, the, the minimum time frame that, that you need uh, to have between each attunement. And so um, I have been a Reiki practitioner since then, and I uh, have also um, been a, a card reader. I do uh, love to read cards, and I've been reading cards for longer than I've been practicing Reiki. And so those, those have to do with my spiritual journey as well. And then, you know, fast forward to now, here I am, and I'm still very much a nature lover still very much invested in nature as the cornerstone of my spirituality. And I am just so very grateful to be able to um, add Reiki into that spiritual practice. Absolutely. I love everything that you just shared. And I would love to come back to Reiki, but actually what you said about nature-based spirituality really caught my ear. Could you explain more about what that means to you? Yes, sure. Thank you so much. Because you're right. It means so many different things to so many different people. And I fully believe that as growing and morphing and evolving human beings, um, what that means for me now is not necessarily what that's going to mean for me in the future. And it's not even necessarily what it's meant for me in the past. Um, what that looks like for me now is just really revering nature honoring it, connecting with it, um, you know, seeing the magic and the miracle in really everything. The fact that even this moment right now is an utter miracle um, is, is just incredible. You know, the fact that we are talking across vast distances is just so awe-inspiring. And, um, and humbling too. So for me, just the earth itself as a very um, well of inspiration, not only our very breath itself, but uh, just all of the, the creativity and the magic of it. I really see the world as very magical and so that nature-based spirituality is a very magical one. Um, some of the things that I do in my nature-based spiritual practice, um, I, I salute the four directions in the morning, I sal salute the earth and the sky. Um, I very much am invested in spending time in nature, hiking, um, playing my flute in nature and uh, spending time observing uh, the earth, observing the trees and the animals and just all kinds of uh, amazing wonder. That's really, I think, what it all boils down to, Izzy, is for me, it's just nature is an incredible source of awe and inspiration and wonder for me. Absolutely. I know for myself, I'm very much connected to water in any form. So whether that's the clouds or a stream or even rain going down the street towards the rain gutter, it's just there's this intimate connection there that just ultimately brings me back to my core. Is that kind of the connection you have with like the woods and, and areas like that? Oh, for sure. Absolutely. And you know, what is so amazing about water is it's just such a an element of flow, you know, this idea that, that water is always going to find the, the lowest point and flow to that. And it's, it's really just incredible when you think about it, um, what water symbolizes and what it means to us and its um, characteristics. So I love that, that you love and, and resonate with water. I am quite a lover of rain. I absolutely uh, love rain. And um, so when it comes to, you know, the, the trees and the mountains and the water, you know, for me, it's just all of it. All of it is awe-inspiring and incredible. Absolutely. You know, going back to water, I was actually watching this fascinating documentary 
Um, I can't remember the name right now, but if I think of it, I'll link it in the show notes. But it was talking about how water naturally moves in spirals or in curves. And so a lot of times in our water systems, the pipes are at harsh angles and water is not meant to move at an angle. And so they've actually done studies that show that the molecular integrity of water can be destroyed or manipulated when it goes through those harsh angles. And I think that's a really beautiful metaphor for life too, that if you're constantly trying to have everything figured out and planned and rigid, you're going to miss the ultimate flow of life as it is to be offered. Yeah, that's beautiful. I love that. And um, such a fascinating study. Um, but you're, you're right. It is such a wonderful metaphor. And I think that's really, you know, earth has just so many lessons for us, so much to teach us. And all we have to do is just observe. Absolutely. And I think too, when you go in nature, you find that release of time, you know, in nature, everything just is. And connecting with that helps us connect, like you said, to our own nature. So is there one particular lesson or many, if you have them, that you feel has particularly impacted you through nature? Yes, thank you for that question. What a lovely question. Um, You know, there are so many, but I will say that um, I have received messages um, from nature itself, and one of them was this idea of a cosmic revelation, and that this world is just a vast unfolding. And so this is the way that I really like to think about not just the universe and its unfoldment, but our lives as well. And it it really just always brings me back to this image of a flower that is opening. And we can't you know, we can't force a flower to open. It's not like we can just grab it and start tearing apart the petals and pulling it open. We have to just let it open in its own time. And I think that that is just so true of ourselves and our own lives is just allowing things to open and flow, to allow things to be like water in a sense, and to honor and respect that process, to know that it is a process and that it takes it takes its time and, um, and unfolds in the way that it is meant to. You know, maybe one petal un- opens up in one way and another petal flops open another way. And that's all okay. You know, accepting and honoring and recognizing that cosmic revelation of our lives, I think is, is one of the important um, messages that I've received from nature. Beautiful. I love that idea of a cosmic revelation. That's a really beautiful phrase for it too. Now, I know that on on the show and on the blog, I'm very much connected to intuition and being guided by your inner voice. Do you feel that nature is that same guiding force in your life? Yes, thank you. Absolutely. Um, I think that when we are still and, um, and listen, that the messages, the um, inspiration is all around us. And so absolutely, you know, I find that when I need to clear my head, um, when I need a new perspective, all I need to do is go sit by a tree or watch a, a stream flowing. Um, all I need to do is go look at some moss or, uh, you know, enjoy a flower. And uh, that is just such a, an experience in which we can tap into our intuition and those messages and receive messages and, and be open to them. So yes, you know, nature is such a conduit for inspiration and for intuition that I am a firm believer that just getting into nature is a way for us to get a new perspective and a way for us to expand and grow and, um, really, you know, as you were saying, nature is just so, it is, it's so unhurried in its experience. And when we can go and be in that unhurriedness, wow, what a 
transformational experience for us if we open ourselves up to that transformation. Absolutely. When you, I mean, when you think about the fact that everything's energy, if you're sitting and you're meditating in your house and you're in the middle of a city or a neighborhood, you may be still in your internal energy, but the energy outside of you is still moving and going. But when you can meditate in nature, you have that resonance of both your external environment and your internal environment, both in that stillness. And I think that's where you get that, those really powerful connected feelings in nature is because it allows you to come into resonance with the stillness of all that is. That's it. You know, connectedness is really what it's all about for me at the center of my spirituality. And I think honestly at the center of spirituality itself, in my opinion, is awareness, meaning, and connection. You know, so a deepening of our awareness, a creation of meaning and connection with all that is, as you say. And so definitely that connection with nature for me is a focal point of my spirituality. I love that. And do you find that you bring elements of that nature connection into your Reiki practice? 100%. Yes. Yes. So the way that I view my Reiki practice, you know, of course, Reiki um, is, it, it, it is, you know, that's really <laughs> all the, 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 the way to sum it up. Reiki is. And that what that means is that there are as many ways to practice Reiki as there are people. And so for me, you know, I think that Reiki is, is like ice cream in a sense, and that the way we practice it is just all the flavors. So I, I love might, that. Like, I chocolate. actually yeah. say that everyone has their own flavor of energy. That's so Oh, funny. yeah. <laughs> Great. Yeah. So, you know, I might like chocolate. You might like strawberry. Um, so, but there's, there's nothing wrong. There, chocolate isn't better than strawberry. It's just that that's my particular taste that, that I prefer. And so I, I believe it's the same way with Reiki and our Reiki practice. And so for me, um, I practice Reiki in a way that may be different from the way that someone else might practice it. Um, but mine does incorporate um, that deep connection with nature. So for instance, before I um, start conducting one of my uh, ceremonies, uh, I will call in the four directions and I will honor the native inhabitants of the land where I reside. And I will call on Father Earth, um, Father Sky and Mother Earth. And so, yes, I do definitely incorporate um, those aspects into my Reiki practice. Beautiful. Do you ever, I've always been curious about this. I know there are some Reiki practitioners who are more focused on things like animals, and I've also heard of actually plant Reiki practitioners. Do you ever Reiki your plants? Yes. As a matter of fact, when I was first attuned, um, that was really all I I gave Reiki to was my plants. I love to garden. Um, I have vegetable gardens and flower gardens. And so um, that's, that was really my primary Reiki practice for a, a number of years was sending Reiki to all my plants. And um, uh, so that's really how my Reiki practice blossomed. Ha <laughs> ha. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Pun intended. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, was uh, through sending Reiki to my plants. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, did you ever notice a difference if there was a plant that didn't get Reiki or even between before you reiki your plants and after? Did you notice a difference in their energy or even in their appearance? That's a great question. And I would say no. And I would say no only because um, I... I, since I give Reiki to all of my plants, I can't, you know, I can't There's say no well. baseline. Right. Exactly. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's funny that you say that I actually have, so I have a knack for finding four leaf clovers. Mm -hmm. I can pretty much find them anywhere. And I've been pressing them and putting them in a, in a picture frame, but I felt bad just picking them. And so I was like, I wonder what would happen if I just picked one and put it in a little pot and reiki it. And typically they only last like one to two days before they start to wither. I've had this four-leaf clover for I think we're on day 27 now, just raking it. And it just, it makes me so happy every time I look at it. 
That's wonderful. I love that. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'm curious, how did you pick the name Standing Stones Healing? Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. So um, as far as my spirituality, I I also am very invested in um, a Celtic type of spirituality, um, the scenery, the landscape of places like Ireland, um, the standing stone structures. And um, one of the things, believe it or not, that I really love is ruins. I love ancient ruins. You know, they're this um, kind of uh, uh, piece from the past that is still standing and still exists. And I think that they are a real testament to weathering the challenges and changes of life. And so for me, you know, here are these ancient structures. And yeah, you know, maybe some of the stones have fallen over. um, But the fact that that they are still standing, I mean, like Stonehenge, for instance, the fact that it still exists is pretty miraculous. Um, Of course, it's had some reconstruction done to it. um, But even so, you know, the fact that, that it's there, the fact that it was resurrect, that it was erected so long ago and that these stone structures um, have been erected so long ago. And, you know, we don't know exactly what their purpose was when they were erected. Um, but for me, they are really uh, very spiritual in that they represent to me um, a connection with the past. They represent to me a connection with nature. And they represent to me the ability to really stand strong um, with the changes of time. And, you know, even with that cosmic revelation. And then also the acknowledgement that eventually those stones will collapse. And eventually those stones will be subsumed back into the earth. And that is all a part of the cosmic revelation as well. Absolutely. There's that continuous cycle of living and breathing and then letting go and releasing and moving into that next stage. Yes. Yeah. So I would love to hear a little more about, you've mentioned a few times finding metaphors in nature for your spirituality. Is there one in particular that really motivates you on a daily basis? Oh, that's a great question. Um, You know, for me, at the center of what I strive for is love. You know, um, I I really believe that that's why we're here, that um, our main purpose is to love. And let's be real, that's, that's a challenge. You know, as human beings, to strive for that in all moments is a real challenge. Um, but for me, uh, that is something that I am always working towards, striving towards to be more loving and in an increasing number of moments. And so, you know, for me, um, one of the, the intuitive messages that I received from nature was this idea of what, what do we love or what is even alive and what is in a sense deserving of our love and, um, you know, deserving of existing in a sense. And I received the message that, um, uh, you know, that, that um, everything that, uh, you know, what is alive and the message was everything with a shadow. And I said, that's everything. And the response I got was exactly. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, really for me, striving to just love everything um, more and more and to uh, really align myself with that idea of love and unconditional love. I'm going to say it again. It's not easy. You know, we are human beings. Um, It is a a challenge, you know, when someone cuts you off in traffic to say, I send you love. I send you love. (laughs) (laughs) So it's a work in progress for sure. Um, But the message is that um, everything um, is alive. And therefore, to me, it, it all deserves respect and love. 
Oh, I love that. I love that. I think I think it's so funny that the the typical example is someone cutting you off at a traffic light. I use that one myself. I've heard so many other people. I think it's so funny that that's like the go to. But do you find that I know that I speak to the difference between what I call mental love and unconditional love that I find that sometimes we have this idea of loving someone the way that we would in a partnership or the way that we love our family. And then I find that it's almost like we were talking about earlier, different flavors of energy. There's almost a different flavor of energy when it's on that soul level of recognition that everything that is alive deserves your love and respect. Do you find that there's a subtle difference there as well? That's a great question. You know, I think that when it comes to love, we have many ways of looking at love and many uh, things that even we will call love that aren't necessarily love. You know, like for instance, maybe we stay in an unhealthy relationship out of quote love, um, but love for whom? And um, so I think that, that oftentimes we as human beings um, serve, you know, we, we kind of um, maybe have multiple ideas of love and we are looking at love in our human kind of way. So we're looking at love through our human glasses because that's all that we ever have is we, we don't have the ability to look at things as not being a human because we are always already human. And we can't pull ourselves out. We, you know, we can attempt and we can say, okay, I'm going to try to look at this as a non-human and we can attempt that. Um, but I think that, that, that we, because we can only see love through being a human, we only, we use um, our humanness to define love. And I think that, that love really transcends um, human, humanness and what it means to be a human. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's a really great way of putting it. So when you say that you think we are all here to love, what does that look like for you? Like, what is your I hate to say goal, but what is what do you think that would look like fully embodied? Compassion, absolutely um, accepting people and saying that, you know, knowing that everyone has had their own individual experiences and increasingly working not to be judgmental of who someone is, where they are, how they got to where they are. Now, again, that's a challenge um, because we are human beings. And human beings have a tendency to judge. And as a matter of fact, that's actually a good thing. The fact that we judge um, uh, will, will help us to stay alive. Um, you know, like, I'm, gee, this stove is really hot right now. Maybe I shouldn't put my hand on it. I'm judging the heat from that stove, um, that burner. Um, and so I think that, you know, judgment can be a good thing. But when it comes to blocking love and when it comes to um, keeping us from having an increased level of compassion and respect, um, that's the time, I think, when judgment does not serve us. And so what it looks like for me is an increasing level of respect for others, of kindness, of um, just compassion and understanding. That's really what it boils down to for me. I love that. And, you know, I think sometimes in the Reiki community or in the spiritual community, there can be this tendency to want to, quote unquote, heal people or fix people. Do you feel like that's a block to compassion because then you are then blocking respect for their ability to take care of themselves? That's a great question, and thanks so much for bringing up this idea of healing, um, because uh, I think that that you know we we all have different ways in which we define ourselves and and define um, our Reiki practice, and I actually don't 
call myself a healer. I know that's funny, you know, standing stones healing. Um, but um, I see it as offering healing experiences and facilitating people's healing and supporting and encouraging their healing. Um, but I don't myself identify as a healer. Now, I will say that if someone else calls me a healer, that's okay. You know, that's the way that they're defining me, and, and I'm fine with that. Um, but uh, I don't call myself a healer. And I think that when it comes to our own healing, it's important for us to remember that it is a process and that even when we have challenges within that healing process, that's part of the process. So, you know, if let's say, for instance, we are having some judgment that is maybe quote, blocking our healing, I actually think that that's part of the healing process too. And that that's something that um, is just a part of that cosmic revelation, that unfolding. And that honoring and respecting that process means also accepting that healing can take time and that healing as a process can be two steps forward, one step back, and that is okay. Absolutely. Now, one thing I hear a lot, and I would love to hear your thoughts on it, is the idea that in order to be fully present for others and available to, like you said, facilitate healing experiences, that we have to first focus on healing ourselves. How do you feel about that idea? Wonderful. Thank you so much for that question. Um, I think that we all have lots of healing to do on multiple levels. Our healing is, quite frankly, never done. And that's because as human beings, um, you know, we, we all are having experiences to heal from. And so it's not like we can get to a point where it's like, all right, my healing is all done. I'm good to go. No more need for any more healing. Well, guess what? Um, you're living a thing called life and <laughs> you're going to need to have some healing and it is an ongoing process. And so I think that if we approach this idea of Reiki being a practitioner, practitioner or any other kind of modality or even just being a human being who listens to other human beings and supports them and encourages them, I think that we may feel pressure to, quote, heal ourselves first before we can, um, quote, heal others. But if that was the case, if we all waited until we were fully healed to start helping others in their healing, there ain't no healing going on. You know? <laughs> 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 because we all have our own work to do on multiple levels. And we can even have experiences where, you know, we feel that we've healed from something and moved on. And then we have an experience that says, oops, nope, I still have some layers with this to unpack. There's still some um, revelation, some unfolding to happen with this experience. And so I don't think the healing is ever done. And I don't say that to mean that um, that's a, a, a negative viewpoint or a pessimistic viewpoint. Actually, I think it's kind of optimistic to be able to say, yeah, you know, it's part of the process. We all heal in our own ways during in our own time and um that is all okay and the healing journey is a journey and that journey is never done absolutely well and i think too sometimes we can find that in helping others we can also heal ourselves and i think you know when we go back to that idea that everything is energy there's that resonance too when you find someone who's also on the same path or even on a complementary path where you find someone who's healed in the area that you are trying to heal i know that that for me a lot of my limiting beliefs, sometimes I like to look at other people and say they don't have this limiting belief. So it's possible to let that one go. 
Yeah, I think that's really great. And um, I think that, that we all have our own individual challenges. And um, I think that really compassion for me is the key to say, you know, a lot of times we'll think, well, you know, this is a, a piece of cake for me. I can do this. Why why aren't, why isn't everybody able to do this? Um, or why are others challenged to do X that I'm have no problem with? But the truth is that we all have our own individual challenges and experiences. We all have our own individual gifts and perspectives. And so I think just an increasing level of honor for that and even reverence too for all of those experiences that you yourself have had and that others have had in their own journey. Mm. And I think when you when you can apply that level of resonance and respect for even the quote unquote negative experiences, that in and of itself can be healing because before you had this resistance or trying to push it away, but in that respect and reverence, you find that you are acknowledging it fully and allowing it to be what it is. Do you find that to be the case? Yeah, and I think that the pushing it away is part of the process too. You know, I think that... Um, that uh, we need to start where we are. And if we are at a point where we are pushing things away, pushing feelings away, you know, of course, I always want to encourage us to um, acknowledge our feelings. And at the same time, you know, pushing feelings away, um, pushing experiences away is a part of the process, is a part of the healing. And um, so I think just honoring that, acknowledging that, and knowing that that is part of the process and that it, it will, you know, unfold as it, as it should. I think that's a fascinating way to look at it because I think I think a lot of times in the spiritual community you hear people talk about how you shouldn't push it away and and how that's something that you just need to move on from and let go but I love the idea that it's actually part of the healing process do you found that do you find that accepting that resistance has helped you on your journey instead of resisting it more? <laughs> yeah, that's really great. Thanks for that question, Izzy. Um, I had an experience a number of years ago um, in which I, um, I had a, a really challenging time. Um, I had been in an abusive relationship and um, was really challenged to leave that relationship. And, um, you know, I'm a confident person. I'm a nice guy. I never thought that I would be in an abusive relationship. It just did not occur to me that that would happen to me. Um, but it did. And I was finally able to leave that relationship. And when I did, you know, of course, um, as a, a time of major life change for me, that was um, a lot of uh, questioning, a lot of emotions. Um, and what I really found for myself is at that time is that I really needed to let myself feel all of the feelings and act on none of them. So like when I had the feeling of, I need to call her back, I need to call her back. Um, and, uh, you know, what am I doing um, to say, no, nope, just sit here in this chair. You're going to feel that feeling. You're going to feel that discomfort, but you are not going to do anything about it. So you can feel the feelings, um, but not acting on them. And of course, feelings, emotions are not permanent. They do leave. They do change. And so I think that that is important to acknowledge. And so for me, you know, feeling that resistance. So it wasn't, it wasn't a denial of the resistance. It wasn't a resistance to the resistance. Um, but resistance has meaning. And so where we resist, I think it's really important for us to pay attention and to acknowledge that we're resisting and even to say, okay, I'm resisting. I just want to acknowledge I'm resisting and I'm going to resist. And that's part of the process too. Yes, I am definitely a proponent of uh, acknowledging your feelings, definitely a proponent of um, processing them, working through them, and knowing that 
that resistance is a part of the process itself and it will work itself out. It's like getting a splinter. You know, we can get a splinter and we'll want to dig it out. And um, sometimes we can dig it out just fine, no problem, and it's gone. But other times it's, we have a hard time getting the splinter out. Or maybe we don't even realize that we have a splinter. Eventually it will work itself out. It may take a long time. You know, it may take decades of your life. Um, it may be something that, that is never fully worked out um, in your experience, but that resistance is part of the experience. So I encourage us to acknowledge the resistance because resistance has meaning. Beautiful. I loved what you said about feeling all the feelings and acting on none of them, because I think there's a tendency to believe that when we fully start tuning into our feelings, that we will need to act on every single one and really listen and, and live through those feelings that we're experiencing. But what you're saying is essentially, if I'm understanding you right, to sit with them and to feel them and to allow them to be, but to acknowledge that they don't have to be brought into the world more than how you're experiencing them in your body. Exactly. For me, it was a really very much a, I am going to allow these, these feelings to pass through me. I'm going to feel them and I'm just going to allow them to move through knowing that I'm going to feel differently later, you know? So maybe right now I really want to pick up the phone and call my ex back, but I know that if I don't act on that, that feeling will pass and then I'll be really glad that I didn't. Beautiful. Now, one thing I'm, I'm really curious to know is, you know, there's this idea that your thoughts create your emotions. And so, for example, when you are in that space of feeling like you want to call your ex back, do you find that when you sit with that emotion and tune into it, your mind wants to offer up more thoughts to create more of that emotion? You know, that's a really fascinating question. I do think that we really have cycles in our lives of thinking and feeling and, you know, almost like a, a rumination in a sense. Um, Nietzsche um, referred to, you know, this idea of, of ruminating our thoughts. He really used the image of the cow chewing on the grass. And I think that we so often get into that kind of mindset where um, we'll fixate on a challenge, fixate on a problem, fixate on an emotion. And we almost get ourselves, we work ourselves into that place. And then um, it can be really difficult for us to work ourselves out of it. And it's like, you know, it, it feeds off of itself. And so uh, I think that that, the, that that is definitely something that we can do. And I think that when we do that, because we all do that, uh, I think that when we do that, for me, um, one of the, the ways out of that is to, and there are so many different ways, you know, to, to tackle that, that kind of rumination. Like, let's say you're worried about something and you're just thinking and thinking and you can't stop thinking about it, is that that's the, the challenge, is that we focus on stopping thinking about that thing. Like, oh, I got to stop thinking about X, Y, or Z, you know, if I, if I want a cigarette, oh, I got to stop thinking about cigarettes. Oh, I'm so, I got to stop think, stop thinking about cigarettes. By the way, I do not smoke. That's just an <laughs> example. Um, but I got to stop thinking about cigarettes. Well, guess what? You're thinking about cigarettes when you are saying, I've got to stop thinking about cigarettes. And so I really think that, that a way out of that cyclical rumination kind of thinking is to rather than focus on what you don't want to think about, focus on what else to think about. So rather than um, saying, okay, I need to stop thinking about this, it's turning that on to what you want to be focusing on instead. 
Beautiful. I love that. And you know, I think when we get stuck in that cycle of rumination, using the cigarette example, you get stuck in thinking alternately about the future and then the past. So you start thinking, oh, I would love to have another cigarette. And then you're beating yourself up for having that thought. So you're constantly on this seesaw back and forth of future to past, future to past. And I think for me, trying of course like you said with love this is so hard in the human experience but trying to find that present moment in the middle of the seesaw where it's balanced and you know one of my favorite ways I'd love to hear one of yours but one of my favorite ways is to when I notice that I'm in that cycle of back and forth back and forth is to look around the room and find something from every color of the rainbow or to try and this one's really fun feel the clothes that I'm wearing not just look at them but feel them as they're sitting on my body so it's it's like you were saying of picking something else to think about and also bringing you back into that present moment so you're not seesawing back and forth yeah absolutely i like that a lot that's that's the awareness in the awareness meaning and connection that i really feel is at the center um, of my spirituality certainly and i feel in a general sense a spirituality um but for me the the way that i bring myself back to that moment and pull myself out of that is gratitude Number mm-hmm. one, that is like my number one recommendation for bringing yourself back to the moment, for um, uh, creating awareness, for really bringing us into the present moment and shifting our energy, increasing our vibration. So it's gratitude. So if I feel myself like getting upset, getting angry, worrying, I will stop. I will say, stop. 10 things. And then I will start listing off 10 things on each of my fingers that I'm grateful for right in that moment. And by the time I hit my 10th finger, I'm blessed to have 10 fingers. By the time I hit that 10th finger, I am phew, back in my body, in the present moment. I've shifted my awareness from that thing that I was worrying about. And now I have put the focus on the positive things, the things that I'm grateful for, rather than on those things that I'm worried about or those feelings that I'm feeling that um, are going to pass through me eventually anyway. Beautiful. So I love that you said listing out those 10 things, because I know when I've gone through um, a few phases of depression in my own life, and when I was really in the thick of it, my mom would tell me to find just one thing in your life that you can be grateful for. And I think sometimes we get in that place where even finding one thing can be so difficult. But I think that's where you come back to what you were talking about earlier, about even your breath and realizing how amazing that is. Just that one breath that you can take in this moment and the fact that you can do that. I'm actually in a physiology class right now and we're learning about the mechanics of breathing. And after that chapter, I just have a newfound respect for the human body and what it can do without us even trying. Uh, Yes, it is incredible, isn't it? And I'm so glad to hear you talk about the breath because that for me is, you know, when it's, you get to the point where you're just like, oh my gosh, I don't, I, I, how, how can I even find one thing to be thankful for? Well, there it is right there. I think it's such a true miracle that the number one thing that we need in order to survive is all around us all of the time. And all we need to do is to take it in. And so if nothing else, we have that. So I love uh, that, that you mentioned the breath. I'm a true believer in the power of the breath. Beautiful. Yes. Well, and I think too, like you were saying, the fact that the one thing we need to survive is around us at all times. I was listening to this fascinating lecture on how if even the hydrogen element itself was spinning like one millisecond off the entire universe as we know it wouldn't exist. How fascinating is that? That it's just so perfectly in sync exactly the way it needs to be. It is incredible. And, you know, whatever you believe in, you know, whether you believe in a higher power or, or none or whatever you believe in, you, you can't deny. Well, I mean, people could deny it, but 
Mike, how can you deny that this is an absolute miracle? We are here by such a slim chance that it's just mind blowing to think about. It is. And, you know, do you find that, because I know you mentioned gratitude and coming back to your breath, do you find that coming to that meditation almost on the miracle of life is another way that you come back into the present moment? Oh, yeah, for sure. For me, it's something as simple as looking at the stars Mm. and just saying, wow, you know, that is incredible, you know, to know that look at all of those stars out there and all of those worlds spinning. And yes, so something as simple as that, I think is a great way to just recognize the power that is around us in every single moment. And not only all around us, but inside of us as well. You know, you mentioned the incredible power of the human body that does all of its human body things without us even thinking about it. I mean, it's just an absolute miracle. And I, you know, for me, sometimes it's uh, just a little, just bulls you over, you know, it's, it's almost too much to contain. I think if we really sit down and think about it. Absolutely. Well, I think you, you almost get on this edge of a, a blissful existential crisis when you start thinking about it. (laughs) You know what I mean? It's like, you just realize that not only are you just a speck in the universe, but you are also the universe. And it's this mind blowing moment of just the beauty that can be in life and that is in life, even if you don't recognize it in the moment. Yes. And that's really why I think that all things deserve respect. And that's really, I think, all about the message that I received from the tree um, that said that everything with a shadow is alive. Mm -hmm. And isn't it true? You know, I mean... We, we, we take so much for granted, and the truth is that everything around us is just teeming with that incredible energy, that, that big bang that occurred that brought us all here to where we are in these moments, and it's just awe-inspiring. It really is. And, you know, I think some people listening to this might be thinking, you know, how can my desk be alive or things like that? And, you know, what I would say to that is there's this idea. This is always, I've always found this really funny as I've traveled on my own Reiki journey when you have people who will contest the idea that everything's made of energy. And, and I always think if you look at chemistry, everybody's taken a chemistry course. And in chemistry, you learn that everything is made up of atoms. And what are atoms made of? They're made of protons and and electrons, which are energy. And so not only has chemistry proven this, but also it's shown that everything, no matter what it is, is made up of the same energy, just in different formations. And so of course, everything with the shadow is alive because we are all from that same energy, from that same source. Exactly. Yes. You know, that that big bang was, you know, just condensed into such a fine point and then kaboom here's everything from that single point it's amazing now you've mentioned the awareness meaning and connection as your kind of three tenets for your spirituality and we've covered awareness and we've covered connection but could you speak to what meaning means for you Yes, thank you so much. What a great question. Um, To me, it's about creating meaning, finding meaning in our experiences and recognizing the meaning in uh, our human experiences, the things that that happen to us. You know, we we create meaning. Um, I think that oftentimes we have a tendency to think that um, meaning is something that is assigned to our experiences by someone else or some other something, you know, that something outside of ourselves gives things meaning. But the truth is that we give things meaning and we actually have the power to choose to give them meaning. Mm -hmm. And so I think for me, it's really about finding meaning 
in my experiences and um, finding um, a, um, a meaning in the things that surround me. So reverence for those things, you know, the things like the desk that, how is this a desk alive? Well, <laughs> let me tell you, thank you so much desk for supporting me right now um, in this conversation. And so it's, it's about really reverence for our own experiences and the stories that we tell about those experiences and um, the, the things that surround us and having reverence for those. So finding meaning in even the smallest things. I love that. I love that. And so now when you, when you talk about how we choose our own meaning for situations, could that apply to our example of someone cutting you off in traffic? Do you, do you apply that idea of ascribing your own meaning to things to help you take a more positive or loving view on life? Yeah, to say, okay, person who cut me off in traffic, thank you for the reminder to continue to strive to be loving in in all moments, or at least in as many moments as I can, mm -hmm. and in an increasing number of moments. And so, yes, you know, seeing experiences as ways for us to learn and grow and seeing experiences as, um, you know, I don't, I don't know that I want to use the word lesson because lesson itself, I think sounds very um, punitive, mm. you know, um, like, um, like we've done something wrong and we need to be taught a lesson, mm. but I think rather as ways that we can expand and deepen and um, remind and remember that uh, we uh, are human beings having a human experience who are uh, really made to be loving and to increase our uh, depths of love. Beautiful, beautiful. So when you use meaning as one of your spiritual principles, do you find that the meaning of, as you said, even the small things add up to create a bigger meaning or are they all, are they all separate for you in, in your experience? Great question. I think that the little, the small things always add up to big things with anything in life. So, you know, for instance, um, telling your friend that you care about them and that you love them. And, you know, sure, you can make a big grand gesture of buying them a cruise and going on a cruise with your friend. Um, and so that might be very meaningful. But you know what's also meaningful is all of the small ways that you say thank you or that you listen, or uh, you send them a note. Um, those small things all add up to big things. And I think that it's the small consistent things that make the biggest impact. So small thank yous and um, encouragements and doing them consistently that add up to big things. So I would say yes to the small things. Beautiful. And that I would love to know, do you have anything in particular? I know for myself, um, I have a lot of personal meaning around aligned numbers, like seeing 1111 or mm -hmm. ladybugs. I always feel really happy when I see a ladybug. Do you have any little things like that in your life that routinely lift you up when you see them? Oh, great. Thank you. Um, lots of things. You know, interestingly enough, I also find four leaf clovers frequently. I have a whole collection. My, my journals are just littered with four leaf clovers oh, that I, I find that. all the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Yep. And, um, so, um, you know, that's, that's one of them. Um, when I see certain animals, I have a real resonance with some specific animals. And so when I see those, um, I 
may I know that they are a message for me, um, or if I'm out um, in the woods and the spirit of the woods leaves me something special, you know, I know that that's for me. And so I definitely um, derive meaning from those experiences and know that those, those small things are the messages that I'm receiving that remind me, quite frankly, that I'm loved. Mm. Beautiful. Now, I know a lot of people think of messages as almost guideposts, like here's where you are now and go this way. Is that how you see them or are they simply messages for that present moment? Yes and yes. (laughs) So (laughs) yes, um, in that um, they can be, you know, a message can be something that's just meant for that moment, something that maybe lifts you up, reminds you that you're not alone, reminds you that you are loved, or it can be something that um, is a message um, that has greater meaning or greater direction. So yes, I, I think for all of those. How about for you? I think both. Like you said, I know that there are times when, for example, we were talking earlier about feeling feeling stressed. And I know for me with, with school, there are a lot of times where I'll find myself getting stressed. And in those moments, I do find that there are messages that get left for me that remind me to come back to the moment, that remind me that I am loved and that I myself am love. Um, and then I also find that there are times when whether I feel like I know what I'm supposed to be doing or or whether I have no clue, I do get those guideposts that are gently leading me down what is for my highest good. And, you know, that comes back to Reiki, right? Reiki always works for the highest good. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I think it's very much a surrendering Mm -hmm. kind of uh, a thing where, you know, just opening ourselves up to the possibilities. You know, this idea of meaning, it is something that, that we create and find for ourselves and no one else can create meaning for us. So I might find meaning in finding a four leaf clover and someone else might just say, yeah, so what? No big deal. Um, it doesn't have the same meaning for them and it, it can't. So we are our own meaning making machines. I love that. I love that so much. Now, I do want to ask, when you find, for example, with the four-leaf clovers, I personally, I'm with you. I think they're extremely magical. But I do know people in my life who just are like, yeah, it's it's a four-leaf clover. So how do you maintain a strong connection with yourself and your meanings while still honoring others who may have different meanings for something that is important to you? That's a great question. And I will say that... If it's really important to you, I think just acknowledging that it is important to you is what's most important. And so, you know, maybe I might be excited about um, finding four leaf clovers and wanting to share those with people. And here I found this four leaf clover and they say, oh yeah, whatever. Okay. Um, I I can get crushed by that. Sure, but it doesn't diminish the fact that I still have the four leaf clover and it still very much has meaning for me. I think that, um, you know, one of the things that, that happens a lot for us as human beings is that we oftentimes are very discouraging of one another. And you know, if, if someone comes to you with a four leaf clover, they're very excited about it and you say, yeah, whatever. Um, you know, maybe it doesn't resonate with you. Maybe it's not exciting for you, but it's obviously exciting for that person. And so it doesn't mean that you need to be excited by it too, but I think just acknowledging their excitement and, um, uh, encouraging their excitement is a positive thing to do. And I will say that if you have people in your life who you are bringing maybe these very sacred things to them and they um, are discouraging, then 
you know, maybe you might choose not to bring those really sacred things to them. I think that it is absolutely okay for us to have things that are just for ourselves and not for others. And I think it's absolutely okay to have things that are sacred and that you have reverence for that you don't share with others. And, you know, they may be things that are just so sacred that you don't even want to share them and open that up to the possibility of being discouraged. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Izzy, what do you think? I don't know. Absolutely. Well, and I think it speaks to what you were talking about earlier about respect, because let's use the example of the four-leaf clover. When you, as the person who is very excited about the four-leaf clover, bring it to someone who's not as excited, respecting them would look like honoring that that is their choice to not be excited while also respecting yourself and honoring that you are excited about it. And then on the part of the person who is, as you said, discouraging about the four-leaf clover, respect could be embodied as honoring the fact that this person is excited about it and also honoring yourself, knowing that you aren't there, but you can respect that person by appreciating that they're sharing something that is obviously important to them with you. So I think it, there is an element of respect there, of knowing yourself and also knowing the other person and making sure that you have respect for both. Yes, it's so true. I think one of the things that, that we can do when that happens is to make that other person's discouragement a reflection of our own values and what's sacred to us. And so then maybe I might say, oh, other people don't really like four-leaf clover so much. Oh, what's wrong with me? Maybe I shouldn't be so excited about four-leaf clovers. And I think staying true to ourselves, as you say, is, is really very important in that. You know, maybe, um, Maybe others uh, aren't, aren't too um, enthused about on my altar. I have all kinds of nature things, feathers and stones. And someone would look at it and say, what's that pile of crap? And, you know, so um, I, don't be, I don't need to share my most sacred objects with everyone. Um, and that's okay. And I think even when we do share the sacred parts of ourselves with others, and um, we may be discouraged to be able to say to ourselves, you know, this maybe isn't something that this other person is enthusiastic about or finds meaning in, but I do, and there is nothing wrong with that. And I think, too, sometimes wherever you are on your spiritual journey, there may come a point where, I know for myself, I went through a period where that almost felt selfish, feeling that either that I should keep something to myself or that I should hold firm in my own beliefs, even if someone else doesn't agree with me. And I think that's a huge moment of evolution when you start to step into the fact that it is okay. Did you go through a similar phase in your journey? Oh, uh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think definitely with things like um, my card reading, um, and uh, really doing that for myself, um, because I find meaning in it. And then I think being um, willing and able to open that up to others and to share that experience with others. And knowing that not everyone is really interested in card readings and, you know, that's not something that, that everyone feels called to and is interested in. And so to me, that doesn't diminish its power for me and its meaning for me. Um, so I think that um, definitely the card reading experiences, you know, um, having that be part of my cosmic revelation and that unfolding and being able to share my card reading with others. Beautiful. Well, and when you look at it in the terms of that cosmic revelation or of that unfolding, it's, it's that realization that you're allowed to unfold exactly as you are, that you as the flower don't have to look like the flower next to you. You're allowed to unfold where you are and how you are. Yes, exactly. So true. I really think that spirituality is so individual 
that we all have our own things that we find sacred. We all have our own ways of identifying spiritually, even with people who maybe share the same religion. You know, we all have a different experience of it um, because we are all each unique individuals. And so I think just honoring that, honoring that difference um, is a positive. Beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I think too, in that honoring, it comes back to that aspect of love and connection and meaning and tying that all together in knowing that your experience is your experience in the moment. And like you said earlier, it's never going to be the same and you're never going to be able to go back. So finding a way to find that gratitude and breathing into the moment and just tying all of that together. Yes. And, you know, because everything is a journey. It may be different in your future. You know, the four leaf clovers may no longer resonate with you and something else might in your experience. And so just acknowledging that and accepting that is part of the journey as well. Beautiful. What a wonderful way to wrap up. But before we do, do you have anything else that you want to speak to about this idea of a journey and evolving as you go? You know, I really just want to encourage everyone on their journey to know that your journey is your own and that it doesn't need to look like anyone else's journey. As a matter of fact, it can't look like anyone Mm -hmm. else's journey because it is your journey. And so just honoring that, um, recognizing that it is sacred, um, viewing your own life with reverence and gratitude, however it might look and whatever your experiences might be, I think is uh, really what I want to encourage us all to do. So thank you. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Christian. And before we say our goodbyes, do you want to share a little bit about the affirmation recording that we are going to be releasing here soon? Yes, thank you. I'm so (laughs) excited. So, so dear listener, um, Izzy and I have put together a recording for you. As a thank you for listening and as a celebration of you and, um, and uh, just your attention. So thank you so much. Yes, we have created a recording of affirmations. Um, Izzy has gone and um, written some affirmations that she has recorded with her beautiful voice, which I'm sure you will agree is, an, is a wonderful voice and an excellent voice for affirmations. Oh, thank and you. yes, thank you. And I have um, played my flute, my Native American style flute, to those affirmations. And we have created a recording that we are happy to share with you. Yes, I am so excited. I was so blown away by how the recording came out. And I myself have listened to it several times. So I am so excited to be able to share it with all of you. But that should come out on Sunday. And until then, Christian, thank you so, so much for coming on the show today. It has been an absolute joy talking to you. Oh, thank you. It's always so wonderful to connect with you. I just want to say thank you for all that you are doing. Um, For those who are listening, if you have not already, please do check out Collectively Quantum on Facebook. It's a very vibrant group. Um, Izzy is a wonderful facilitator. She is excellent at creating community and being a spiritual leader. I also want to give a shout out to the Reiki uh, Learning Group that she moderates as well, which is a very welcoming group. Um, So for um, anyone who is a Reiki practitioner or Reiki curious, Reiki interested, um, a fan of Reiki, wherever you might fall on that spectrum, I encourage you to come check that out because it is a very welcoming and supportive group um, with um, more than a thousand members at this point. So it's really astonishing um, what Izzy has done and all of her dedication. So I just want to say thank you to you for your commitment and devotion. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And yeah, I will leave all of the links for both my groups and my website and Christian's YouTube and his website down in the show notes so you guys can find all of those there. And when the affirmation recording does release, I'll be sure to add that to the show notes as well. Christian, thank you so, so much. Oh, thank you. My honor and pleasure and best wishes for your journey. 
Christian, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It was an absolute joy to talk with you. You can find Christian and Standing Stones Healing on YouTube, Facebook, and his website at Standing Stones Healing, or find all the links in the show notes. Stay tuned until Sunday when I'll release our affirmations recording. I am so excited to bring this project to you all, and I hope you find as much joy listening to it as I did in recording it. Thank you guys so much for listening, and I'll see you next week at the Conscious Cafe. Thanks for coming to the Conscious Cafe. Come back next week for your consciousness refill, or keep the vibes going by subscribing to the podcast, following the blog, or joining me on Instagram at Collectively Quantum. Find all the links in the show notes, or head over to CollectivelyQuantum.com. Until next week, it's always a beautiful day at the Conscious Cafe.